Um, we're going to go on to Philippians 1. And uh, my goal with this morning and then maybe going later on in this year is I'm just going to kind of hone in on Philippians. So every time that I come in and fill in for Greg, we're just going to go back to Philippians. Uh, I've been studying the book for about a month, two months now. And I've just been just really reading it. I'm going to write in a commentary on it and uh, over the next year. And uh, so I just kind of wanted to share with you what the Lord's been sharing with me through this book. And it's a long study, uh, but it's, it's such an amazing uh, book and letter, I should say, um, that I think that it's, it's applicable to the church where we're at right now as a body. Um, so if you want to open up to Philippians 1, you're more than welcome to. Uh, when I get started, I'm going to kind of read a chunk of the text for you, um, and then we'll dive in, doing a little verse by verse. But to begin, I, I kind of wanted to set up a, a, a proposition for you. Sometimes life sucks. If we're honest about it, sometimes life just really sucks. Sometimes life goes wrong. Sometimes, though you have the most amazing plans in the world, they go so crooked and astray, and it leaves you stressed and worried and broken. Because life's not perfect. And, and the one thing that I've learned over the years is that no matter how much we try, life doesn't work the way we always want it to work for us. Because sometimes you find yourself in chains in a Roman jail cell with no hope and no idea of when you're going to get out of that jail cell. Well, that's kind of the case as it was for Paul. And I think my point here is that some of us have found our own jail cell in our lives. Some of us have found our own place, for lack of better words, of suckiness. You know, it just isn't perfect. It's not what we had intended. You know, sometimes it's momentary. Sometimes it's a year-long thing. I don't know where that's, you're at in life right now. But when Paul's writing this letter, he addresses this. Now, Paul writes this letter to his family, to his friends, as a brother. He doesn't write it as an admonition. He doesn't write this as a, as a stern rebuke, if you will. He writes this as an encouragement. Because to some of them in this church, they're going through this thing as well. And the overall overarching theme of Philippians is Paul is sitting in a jail cell. Remember this. This is so key. Every time you read a verse, every time you read a chapter in Philippians, you have to put it in context, all right? Because text without context is a con, all right? And you have to put this in context to understand that here is a guy sitting in a jail cell, most likely attached with chains to two guards at all times. And that's an amazing, amazing picture to think about how this letter was written. Because it should change the entire overtone, if you will, of the letter and how it should speak to your life. You see, Paul says, even though life may suck sometimes, remember this, that God is there, that your Savior is here and he is alive. And do not worry, because worry robs you of the peace that God has intended for you. You see, do not worry, because worry does nothing for your life. You can worry and worry and worry and stress out about every single thing going on, and it does nothing to change your stature in life. It just makes you more stressed out, more burdensome. More burning down. You see, Paul says, I am sitting in a jail cell in chains with no idea as to when I'll actually be set free. But I'm at peace. And my dear friends, rejoice. Have joy. You see, that's an over, that's a theme that kind of runs throughout this whole book. Is have joy. Joy, not a fleeting, momentary uh, uh, feeling that comes up, bubbles up, makes you smile and passes away when the next piece of crap comes and sticks on your windshield. No, it's, it's something that lasts. It's something that endures. You see, Paul is saying, seek the enduring peace. Seek the enduring joy, which is only found in Jesus. See, this is the message of Philippians to you. And so as we go through this text, I don't want you to lose this main picture. And if you only walk away with this main picture, I'm cool with that. Remember that Paul is sitting in a jail cell, writing to his family, writing to his beloved children as a loving father. This is the context of it. This is a church that Paul has planted. He has spent years ministering to this church. He's sacrificed himself for this church. He has, he has taken nothing from them, but given all of himself to them. And here he says, listen, my friends. I'm so proud of you. I love you so much. You are a part of my heart. But always seek peace. Always have joy. Always rejoice in the Lord who is there with you, no matter your circumstance. Because your circumstance does not define you. The Lord that lives in you defines you and encourages you and strengthens you and, and shows you who you really are. So I want to begin by reading to you a chunk of this letter. Some things I th sometimes um, I think we don't <clears throat> remember that this text wasn't just a book with numbers and chapters in A.D. 35, 60, whenever Paul wrote this. All right? When he wrote this, it was a letter. It was a love letter, if you will. 
And when it was read to the church, he just came, he sat down, the, the, the recipient of the letter took the letter, sat down in front of his church, and said, listen to me, read. So I'm going to read you the entire book. I'm just kidding. That's a joke. No? Okay. All right. But I want to read you the first chapter and a little bit into chapter two, because I just want you to get the picture of chapter one. And if we don't come back to this for a month or three months, that's fine. But maybe this will encourage you to go study this at home. I've read this book probably 25 times, maybe 20 times in the last month and a half, just studying and studying and reading it, all right? And I promise you that when you pour yourself into the word, you're going to find Jesus. But more than that, he's going to seek you and find you right where you are. And that's what I want you to find this morning. But more than that, I want you to find that every single day as you open your Bible. So verse 1, if you want to read along, I think it's on the screens. If you just want to listen, that's totally up to you. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and the deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you in all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. You see, it is right for me to feel this way about you, since I have you in my heart. And whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. See, God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. And as a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. You see, it is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. See, the latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. But the former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, that what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. And I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage, so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. So if I'm going to go on living in the body... This will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. See, I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is by far so much better. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain. And I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. So whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. See, this is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you, my friends, will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Since you're going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. So therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, 
have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God as, to be, as something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So therefore God highly exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but how much more in my absence, continue to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in the quarter in order to fill his good purpose. Let's pray. Lord, after all that, I'm not sure how much more my words can do. But Jesus, I just thank you for the opportunity to stand here before your body as a member of that body, equal and servant to them in the best way that I can in all the ways that I know how. And I ask Jesus that your words would be spoken through these lips for the edification of the body and for your glory. God, that's all I want. That's all I need. Jesus, you're enough. Gosh, you're already here. I don't need to ask you to come fill this place. I know you're already here, living and moving and speaking and breathing. And I just ask that we would tune into your voice now. Amen. So with all that, let's jump back to verse 1. So Paul opens the letter in his customary fashion. He says, Paul and Timothy, the two, the, uh, Paul is the author of the letter, but Timothy is probably his, I believe that's amanuensis, the one who would write the letter for him. I believe that's uh, the context that we're looking at here. Um, and he, he introduces himself as a servant of Christ Jesus to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons. And just the one thing I want you to take from this letter is remember the context. So Paul is not saying, in a lot of letters he says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus. He doesn't say that here, right? He says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus. And that change in word is so important because it, it, it tells you what his mindset is in this letter. See, Paul is not writing to the Philippians with a mindset of authority over them. He's writing to them with a mindset of humility before them. Does that make, different, that make sense? There's a big difference in the whole theme of the letter, if you will. See, Paul is not writing to correct or to rebuke or to admonish them in some way as, as the one who planted them, as the one who stands over them in Christ. No, he is saying, my family, my friends, I am a servant to you in Christ. And so he addresses the church as those who are in Christ, God's holy people, God's family, if you will, and their leadership, their overseers and deacons. So he is writing a letter to the body and those who lead the body as a servant to the church, not as one who stands over the overseers, if you will. And then he says, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, this is a very common theme. If you look at Romans and Galatians and most of Paul's letters, you're going to see this same variation of grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And the best way I can look at this verse is this is the recipe for success in our life, right? So grace is God's unmerited favor towards us who are in Christ, right? That even though we're unworthy, God still gave us grace, still accepted us in his grace. And then he says peace. See, it's a peace, like I said, it's, it's not a fleeting feeling. It's an it's a enduring, lasting presence of Christ in you. And so Paul's desire for his church is that first that they would know that, that they are recipients of grace and that they are called to live in peace, but that this should be their pursuit in all things. This should be our pursuit in all things, grace and peace. See, this is the mark of our life, is that we would know the grace we have received and we would live in accordance with the peace that we have received. I think peace is this weird thing because all of us want peace. No one in this room says, I want to live in turmoil, unless you're like Orange County Real Wives or, you know, on Gilmore Girls or something like that. You, you don't actually want to live in turmoil, all right? You may enjoy watching it on TV, but in your life, you want peace. But the thing is, is I think sometimes we don't realize how much we allow our peace to be robbed from us. Because we let worry and anxiety and stress and all the things we talked about when we opened this message to rob that peace from us. The peace that was never meant to leave us. Because the moment you are 
where you were accepted in the body of Christ. You were accepted and you were grafted in the body, I should say, and you were grafted into peace. You were not grafted into division or strife or anger or malice. See, those were all the things that were taken away on the old man. But see, the new man is forged in peace. That's why I've been coming to this place of, of, of nonviolence, if you will, this, this place of, of, of being a servant of peace, you know, trying to pursue peace in all things, in all my relationships. Because peace is the one thing that if, if someone looks at your life and they say, that, that dude, that girl, she is just, she's always at peace in herself. She's always at peace with one another. Whether they know you're a Christian or not, that should be the mark of your life because that should stand out. Because peace, where Christ is found, there is peace. But where Christ is being pushed out, there's a lack of peace. So Paul continues. This is where he gets into his prayer, um, his, his heart, I guess you will, for this church. He says, I thank my God every time I remember you. I can just imagine that Paul is sitting in that jail cell, and every day as he's sitting there, 23, 24 hours a day, there's 24 hours a day, I'm not saying there's not, but I'm just saying he probably slept at some point during that day, um, that he just constantly was in prayer for his church. Like when he says, I thank my God every time I remember you, and I'm reading an NIV, I'm sorry if it's different than the one on the screen, um, but I really like this new NIV translation, I think it's 2011, and it's, it's really good, so uh, that's where I'm coming out of, but... I just, I just think that Paul's literally sitting in this place of peace, in this place of prayer for his body, continually supplicating for the church before God, just remembering Lydia, remembering Timothy, and remembering all of his disciples and all those that came with him, just continually lifting them up to the Father. You know, there's, there's people in this church that continually live a life of prayer. I wish I had that gift. I, I know I don't, all right? I'm growing in our prayer relationship. But when I see people especially those that are around me, show me what it means to pray. It's so encouraging because it, that's the thing that should be a part of all of our lives. Open your day with prayer and close your day with prayer. You see, Paul lived in a place of prayer. His life was a living prayer before the Father. And so when you read about him saying, oh, I remember them in my prayers, this is not like, oh, thank God, you know, please remember the church of Philippi. No, this was like a lasting mark of his life, was, a, was living in a place of prayer. It's also think, something that I think that we all should strive for in our own lives because prayer is the one thing that we kind of put to the side. We, we do these Hail Mary prayers. You know, we blame the Catholics for screwing it all up, but really we do the same thing too as well. All right, God, bless them. Thank you so much, Jesus. Fix this need for me. Let's move on with my day. You know, but prayer is something so much more. And it's also about 10 more sermons, so I'm going to move on from that. So, um, In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. There's that mark of joy again. If you're reading in your Bibles, you may want to circle that, mark, that word joy, or the word rejoice, or just highlight it, underline it, because I promise you, you're going to see it over and over and over again. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. What's important about that is kind of one thing. It's that this church fully surrendered themselves to Christ. There was not a half-hearted following of Jesus. No, see, they, when Paul says to somebody that I am so thankful for your partnership in the gospel from the very first day that I came and preached it to you until now, that means that these people actually understood what it really meant to become followers of Jesus. You see, they didn't just pray their sinner's prayer and believe the ABCs, which is just a watered-down version of what the gospel actually is, and, and say, okay, well, we'll follow Jesus somewhere, somehow. No, they actually knew what it meant to die to themselves daily to follow Christ. Because, you see, when Paul preaches the gospel, he preaches one thing, and that's Jesus Christ. And because of his proclamation of Jesus Christ, as he talks about in Corinthians, he suffered all things that men could suffer, shipwrecked, beaten, nearly crucified. I mean, he did everything to suffer, and he suffered over and over and over again. That, he just distracted me completely. It was 10 minutes, right? Okay, all right. You're supposed to tell me when I have 10 minutes left. All right. Wow, there's that train of thought going. Whew. Um, so I, I just think, wow, that went way out of the window. Okay. Uh, so when Paul is preaching the gospel, you have to understand the context through which he preached it. When he preached Jesus, right, which is the only thing he preached, he says, I preached Christ and Christ crucified, and that's all that matters to me. He knew what it meant to preach that gospel, to suffer for that gospel. And so when a church 
engaged in that gospel in this way, they willingly took up everything that that meant. And you're going to read in the New Testament where the church of Philippi were sacrificially following Jesus. They were servants to Paul. They gave everything that they could, whether in times of need or in times of abundance. This church gave themselves to Paul and to the working of the gospel. And so, again, it's, it's just an encouragement to understand where this church is at and where I hope that we would all strive to be at in our own walks. That the gospel is not just a belief in something. It's so much more than that. It starts with an understanding that to even believe, you have to die. You see, we die once for all, forever, because we die once to ourselves to enter into that place in Christ Jesus where he comes and lives in us so that we might forever live in him. You see, this is what this church understood. This is what we must understand, that this dying to ourselves is the first step to entering into that relationship with Christ, to entering into that relationship that is marked by peace and grace forever. Paul says, I am confident that the one who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. You see, Paul constantly, earnestly prayed for this church. He set his heart before God. He set his desires for this church before God. He says, Father, I want what is best for this church. I want Christ to be magnified in this place. And this place, this church, knew what it meant to follow Jesus, to die to themselves to follow Jesus. And so Paul says, I am so assured of this that I would give my life, I stake my word to say that the one who began the work of salvation in you will finish it. There is not a he may finish it. There is not a possibly he's going to finish it. No, he will finish what he began. Because see, you church... You entered into that relationship. You willingly sacrificed yourself in that relationship with the Father, and the Father will complete what he began in you. And again, and I know I keep going back this way, and I just I want this to become personal to you in your own life, is that the God who began at work in you will complete it. As you submit yourself unto him, and understand when Jesus said that you were to die to yourself daily to follow me, to take up your cross and follow me daily. See, this is not just a figure of speech. It is literally a dying to oneself, putting off the old man to take on the new man. This is what the gospel does. He says, if you do this, if you set that side that old man, if you allow grace to consume you and to let the salvation well within your soul, God will complete it. See, when Paul talks about the day of Christ, he talks about one of two things. He's either talking about the day where we stand before judgment, we stand in judgment before the Father for all the things that we have done, good and bad in the body, and or he's talking about the day where he comes to, re, he comes to ransom his bride and to bring his bride home with him. Right? When the bridegroom comes to, to let the bride enter into his uh, eternal dwelling place. And so that promise that we have, the day of Christ, which is marked all throughout Philippians, Paul is saying that is a sure thing. That is something where you can stake your hope in life. You can say, I always know that no matter what storm I go through, I have this hope as an anchor in my soul that this day will come. That my Savior, that my bridegroom will come and take me home with him forever. That eternal life has already been given to me and it will be mine. This is the promise that you can always hang your hat on. See, this is the promise of the gospel. And this is the thing that Paul is so sure of for this church. So he continues in verse 7. He says, It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart. And whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you, church, share in God's grace with me. In the same mark of grace, it it was the one thing that that always marks their life. It's the one thing that this church understood, that they were recipients of grace. And he goes on to verse 8. And I want to read it to you, and then if anybody has a different translation than what I have, I'd like you to read that too as well. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. You may have it differently. It's all the same. There's another translation that says that God is the witness to my affection for you. There's another, what do you have? For God is my record. For God is my record. God is my witness. Interesting way to put bowels, right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's fitting, though. I don't know about you guys, but sometimes I just, like, I'll sit in my house, 
I just ignore my kids. I'm just kidding. Well, sometimes, you know, it depends. Depends on how crazy they are that day. But I got this chair in my back room, and I just sit down. It's probably why I like to sit when I preach, too, because this is just where I study from. I just sit down, and I open up the scripture, and I just read. And sometimes I'll just read it through, and I'll go back, or sometimes I just get completely lost for an hour and a half on three verses. No idea why or how that happens, but about three weeks ago, I was reading through, and verse 8, it just, it, it just hit me like a rock. I mean, it just stuck in my heart so hard. And I, and I think I was by myself at this point in time. And I was just praying through verse 8. And I read it over and over and over and over again. You know, and, and I read it just like this. That God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And I, and I didn't know why at first this was sitting in my soul so hard. Because on the surface, you're like, okay, God will testify how I long for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. Essentially, God knows that Paul loves these people, right? That's, that's essentially what he's trying to say here. But there was more than that. There is more than that in this little few words. And so as I prayed through it, the Father spoke, and he revealed this. He said that I will testify how I long for all of you with the affection, how Paul longed for all of you, church, with the affection of Christ Jesus. And that only means two things. It's either metaphorical, and that Paul believes that because his relationship with the Father was so intimate, and that all his desires, the Father knew because the Father's desires were his desires and the, the desires of Christ were his. And so that he is metaphorically saying that God is my witness. And I love these people so much that God is the one who has witnessed this love that I have for this church. Does that make sense? That God has seen his love and God knows his love because Paul has poured out his heart in prayer over and over and over and over and over again for this church. And Paul, and God knows the love that Paul has for these people. See, or it means another thing, and this, whether it does or not, I think this is a, a tone that Paul is trying to strike in these few words. Paul is saying that I have petitioned God so much for these people. I love these people so much. I have accepted the will of God for these people. I have sought to proclaim the will of God to these people. I have loved these people with an agape love, the love of Christ, in so much a way that God himself would testify to these people if they were to doubt it. And there, was, and there is so much power in understanding it that way. Because think about that. Now, I don't know how many people were on earth 2,000 years ago, and I really don't care, but it was more than 10, and it was probably more than a million, all right? And even if it was only a million, which I can't fathom because there's like 7 billion people on earth right now, that Paul would have such a faith to believe that the God of creation who created everything and all things would speak on his behalf to a people because he loved them that much. How amazing is that? How amazing is that? Paul had a relationship with God that was so intense that he believed that God would split the, the skies to speak on his behalf to another people. That God would say, this son of mine loves you so much. He would give his life for you. He has given his life for you. And he loves you because of my son. How amazing is that? It's pretty freaking cool to me. It's pretty amazing. You see, when Paul gave everything to God in that jail cell, God had his entire life in his hands. And, and, and Paul's relationship was with one person, the Trinity. There you go, I'll bring it in. Right? The Trinity. His love for God stemmed because he had a relationship with Christ that fleshed itself out through the Spirit within him. And in as he dealt with this people group, he had such an intense love for him that he believed God would speak on his behalf to edify that church to say, don't listen to any other false gospel. Don't believe any other lie. The message of Jesus Christ is the only gospel, and it is true. And this servant of mine, he loves you so much because of that gospel. And if this message is true, and this is what Paul is saying, it has to come back to our hearts somehow and in some way. And I guess when it came back to me, the Spirit said, Tom, do you love these people that way? Tom, do you believe that God would actually testify on your behalf to this church of your affection for them? You see, affection is not a feeling. Affection is a, 
oh, God, it's a feeling in a way, but it is a, it is a, it is a, um, it is this fruit of the spirit, if you will, that starts in the bowels of your soul, where the spirit lives inside of you in the deepest, most place. The affection we have for one another, the relationship that we are supposed to have with one another should be marked by that spirit living inside of us that connects one another. So that the relationship that I have with Becca, the relationship that that I have with each one of you is to be so intense, so intimate, because it is Christ working through each of us to one another. So that when I touch Ariel, I touch Christ. And when Ariel touches me, she touches Jesus. This is what it means to be a part of the body. This is how Paul saw his relationship with this church. And my question to myself was, would God testify that I love these people that much? And I honestly don't believe he would. And now, is this a failure on your part? No. It's a failure on my part. You see, I'm still working out my salvation with fear and trembling, as Paul talks about in the next chapter. I'm still doing that process. And every time I get the privilege of being with you is a part of me working out that salvation before you and with you. And I am desiring to be in a relationship with you that is, that is marked by the affection of Christ Jesus. But if I'm being honest, and I bet if you're being honest, you won't believe that God would testify on your behalf because you love me that much. I'm way too ugly for that, all right? And I don't think that God would do it on my behalf because of you. Because I haven't fully sacrificed and surrendered myself to you, to the body of Christ. I've kept so many things distracting me for so long. I wear so many different hats as a father, as a husband, as a cop, and all the other things I won't tell you about that I do because I, for some reason, need to start websites and programs and businesses and all that stuff. But I've allowed myself to get so distracted by other things that the one thing that I've set on the altar of those things is my relationship with the church. And I bet you that it is probably the same in your life. Now, some of you, it's not. Maybe some of you actually believe this. See, the one thing that I love about Greg is that I believe that this is true of him. And this is not me playing and blowing up his sails, because you don't need to tell him this, all right? But the one thing that is true of Greg is that he has given himself to this church, and that he truly loves this body with the affection of Christ Jesus, and he has given all of himself to you so that you might know Christ. Now, there is no other desire in his heart than that singular desire, that you would know Christ. Because in his heart, I don't know him as well as you, I'm sorry, okay? But I know him well. In his heart, he knows you are his family. He knows you are part of the body that he has been grafted into. And he knows that you are the mark of Christ on his life. You are the living letter of his testimony before Jesus. And he truly believes this way about you. And that is so encouraging to me. I I, I want that with a body, with this body, with, with the church. But I know I'm not there yet. And I bet you, you were, honestly, if you, if you, if you put away the pride, and I, and I don't mean to be speaking against you or any way, shape, or form. I just want to speak to your heart. If you put away the pride in your life, this is probably true of you. Because I know as I put away the pride in my life and sought humility, that this is true in me. You see, it doesn't take a village to raise a child, but it sure does help. See, the church is our village, We need one another. We cannot express Christ in the fullest manner if we are separate from one another. Now, I thought we could. Now, I went on a journey two and a half, three years ago into the deeper parts of the deeper uh, understanding of Jesus Christ. And in doing so, I removed myself from the body. Because, you see, I thought that the traditional church wasn't good enough. You see, I thought that I needed something different because the way we run church, the way we administer church, isn't perfectly the way that the New Testament talks about. So I ran away from it. Now I was here and I flirted back and forth. Obviously, you know my face. But I'm not talking with just this, but I'm talking with the church in general. And I ran away. And it wasn't until the last few months the Lord spoke to me and he said, you have put all these things on this body, and yet you have forsaken the one thing that it really is, and that is my people, your family, your church, who I have revealed myself to be. I've forsaken Christ in each one of you. I've forsaken Christ in his body because I thought I needed people that thought and and, and reasoned through the scriptures the way that I did in regards to the administration of church. But even if things aren't perfectly the way the New Testament works, because in the New Testament we didn't have lights and awesome speakers and PowerPoints and all this nonsense, right? This is what the New Testament had. One another. There's 58 one another commands in the New Testament. 
It must mean something important that we care for one another with the affection of Christ Jesus. You see, the one thing that has always peeved me, if you will, or I've had a struggle with in the church, is how we have set aside the relationship of the church as a family on the altar of everything else in our lives. You know, we can't come together, and I'm not saying we as in this specific body, all right, please don't take it that way. But as a church, because I was part of a much larger church before this, every time they said, well, what about this fellowship night, or what about doing this together, what about coming together to serve in this way, I said, oh, you know what, but people go to dinner on that night of the week. You know what, maybe people are going to be out of town that night of the week. And we forsake the assembling together as a family of Christ, as the body of Christ, because we put the other stuff in our life as more important. What always bothered me about that was Jesus didn't do it that way. And it doesn't matter if we look like the same way Jesus did, because none of us are wearing sandals with probably no bottoms, walking through the desert with 12 people with no job. See, that's, it doesn't matter that we're different that way. This is who we are now in this time. But we haven't understood that same core message. And that Jesus, when Jesus said that my family is those who do the will of God, he really meant it. In my own life, I know that the closest connections that I have are forged with the blood of Christ. They're not forged with the blood of familial line. And it's hard to come to that place. But I'm completely at peace in that place. I know that the closest people that know me, that care for me, that love me, are those that I've only known for four to six years. Those are the relationships that matter most because they have been broken and they have been forged through the blood of Christ. So they know who I am because they know who the God that lives in me. But see, my family doesn't know that. They don't know the God that lives in me. They think I'm some weird guy that preaches and has this religious life and who doesn't understand how I can accept a God. So they don't get that. It's so, there's a divide between us. And I don't set aside, well, I have, but I, and I hate to admit it, but I try not to set aside my life with my family in Christ for the life of a family that doesn't even know me because they don't know the God in me. You see, when I go back to this verse, this, this is where I come out. That the desire of Paul, the desire of God for his church, is as Paul expressed it here, is that we would love one another with the affection of Christ Jesus, so much so that God would testify on our behalf to one another. Because I feel, like, I feel that if we have a relationship in this manner, then we'll actually achieve the thing that we have so desired, and that is to be a light to the world. But you see, I don't understand why I would want Jesus, if I wasn't already here, if I came into a church, not this church, but any church, and all that they did was people passing by, filing in and out of doors. Why would I want that? You see, all of us need relationship. All of us need satisfaction and fulfillment. All of us need one another. That's ingrained in our DNA. And so if I'm an unbeliever, why do I want to go to a place where they don't even see me? They don't even love one another. But when they love one another, I want that. And it's hard to put into words, and it's hard to express, and it's hard to understand. But what I want is a family. You see, this is one picture of the church that we have so forsaken as a new and forsaken in the last hundred years. Because we believe the ABCs. We believe it was all about church programs and evangelism and doing all this stuff, right? We set apart the best thing. We set apart Jesus for the good stuff. Now, evangelism programs and traditions, these are good things. But because we focused on these things first... We forsake Christ, and in forsaking a full revelation of Jesus, we forsake seeing each other as one in Christ. And this is where Paul is going in this verse. And for some of you, are like, Tom, I have no idea where you got that, all right, and I get that, all right. And for some of you may disagree with me in that, and I'm fine with that. But if you disagree, come to me. Don't come to anybody else. Come to me because part of being a body is coming to, the, to each other and saying, I don't see it the way you see it. And that's fine. And we can agree to, uh, to seek this truth together as one. But if all that we do is say, I don't agree, and so I walk out the door, then we have perpetuated the division that exists within the church as already. Paul's desire is that today in this church, we would come to a place to love one another in so much a way that it would define who we are. And so that the world would actually see us as a city on a hill shining the light onto all those who are lost. So we would be the light on the lampstand shining our light forward. So we would be the salt that seasons the earth. Do you see where I'm going with this? This is what Jesus is talking about. This is what Paul is talking about in the scriptures. The scriptures is not just knowledge to fill our minds. It is actually something to define how we live and to shape how we live and how we experience Christ. 
this is my desire for my own life, and this is my desire for you. This is my desire for us. So I'm going to finish this. I'm going to read two more verses. How am I on time? Way past. <laughs> I'm going to read two more verses, and I'll close out. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. When Paul exhorts his church, his family, to grow in their love, rooted in knowledge and depth of insights, he's saying don't grow in love in a feeling. Grow in love based upon the knowledge of Christ, upon the knowledge of his truth, and grow in the depth of your insight, which means be able to discern right from wrong based upon the wisdom of God at work in you. And th- when, you, when you seek the truth of God, then the love of Christ will abound and it will blossom in your soul. See, this is what he's talking about here in this next verse. And it's so important to me what verse 10 says. is that so you may be able to discern what is best. And as you discern this, thus the natural outcome of your discernment will be to be pure and blameless for Christ. So the first aspect of discernment is knowing right from wrong. Because as your nature changes in Christ, so the natural outcome of your faith is good. The natural outcome of what you desire is good. Right? So you learn to put off the malice and all that which is wrong. But the second part is you understand how to select the best things from the good things. Because we don't have time in our lives to be completely consumed with just those things that are good. We need to pursue that which is best and believe that the good things will flow as we pursue the best thing. And if you know me, you know that the best thing is a person. The best thing is Jesus. You see... I wrote, a, <clears throat> I wrote an article this week about this, and I'm not going to share the whole thing with you. I just want to touch on a few points. You see, if we want to know the best thing, then we need to know Jesus as Moses. We, sorry, excuse me. We need to know that Moses was a picture of Jesus. See, Moses, the shepherd of Israel, is a picture of Jesus, our shepherd. Right? We need to understand that Abraham and Isaac are a picture of Jesus. We need to understand that <clears throat> the wisdom of Samuel and his instruction of Israel pointed to Jesus. If we are to discern what is best, we need to understand first and foremost that Saul served as an example of a man who was the antitype to who Jesus was. We need to understand David as the leader of Israel, a man after God's own heart, also was a forerunner of Christ. And when you move into the New Testament, we need to understand who Jesus is as the living word of God. We need to understand Jesus as the son of God, the living water, the living bread, the new temple, the bridegroom of of who has come to court his bride. We need to understand Jesus as the first fruit of God's elect family. We need to understand Jesus as the incarnate God. You see, these things are not just pieces of knowledge for us to attain. You see, as we understand Jesus in these ways, then we ourselves will become shepherds. As we know Jesus as the living word of God, we will become a living fountain that speaks the word of God forth. It's called evangelism. As we understand Jesus as the first fruit of God's family, we will understand how we fit into that family. You see, all those programs and all the good things that we have set before us, if we put them aside and first seek Christ, that they will come in their own time in an organic faith, in an organic fashion. But we first have to seek Christ. Because if Jesus is what is foremost and what is first in our lives, then the struggles and the worries and anxieties and all the division that we see will fade away. It's not going to happen overnight, but they will fade away. And the best things, the eternal things, will define your life. I want to close out with something that I wrote this week as uh, the band comes up. You guys still do that? I think so. Um, You don't have to close your eyes, but if you want to, that'd be cool. All right? Because I just want to speak this to your soul. I just want to speak this to your heart and encourage you in this way. Many of us have misunderstood our purpose. See, it's not to do what the world does and have success, to raise kids that will one day achieve the American dream. See, it's not to accumulate possessions or seek worldly pleasures. These things aren't bad, but in themselves they are empty and hollow. 
See, we have thought that Jesus meets our needs in life, but when it comes to understanding how to live for him, we live out in the pursuits of the flesh, not the spirit. And thus, in so doing, we focus on simply church growth and evangelistic methods and all these other things. And so even though we fill our days with activities that revolve around the church and around Jesus, we have still failed to understand our purpose. But you see, Paul didn't have this problem because Paul had one desire, Jesus. See, he understood that his life was not his own. See, for him to truly live was to live in the abounding riches of Jesus. See, this simply was enough. This simply is enough. This, my friends, my family, is everything. Today, I hope that we could come to find this truth again in our lives, is that we would learn that Jesus is simply enough, so that when we are tempted to seek broken and temporal things, even within the church, that the, we would understand that these things do not endure. They don't satisfy, for churches will rise and fall, take my word from it. People will come and go. Projects will find success, and then they will falter. But through it all, one thing remains. Jesus. He never ends. He never fails. He's ever and always present. He always remains. And you see, my friends, that this is the simple and beautiful truth of the gospel. That our purpose as believers and as humans is to live and find ourselves in Jesus as he comes to live in us. For he is always seeking to restore us to himself so that we might experience divinity, the presence of the Trinity, in this temporal, earthly state in which we find ourselves. My friends, my family, we are his, his servants, his sons, his daughters. And if we can find this, then we have found everything. <laughs>